Cecilia Mangara Brainerd here to give a talk entitled Ubek, Cebu Reimagined for the Cebuano Study Center as part of the Vicente Soto's Soto Lecture Series. As a Cebuana, I am thrilled to be part of this and wish to thank Drs. Hope Sabanyu and B. Lastimosa for including me. As some of you know, I am a writer and editor of over 20 books, including three novels and four short story collections. Many of my stories use the setting Ubek, which is Cebu backwards. My mythical setting of Ubek, U-B-E-C, is a lot like Cebu, but it isn't the real Cebu. This talk is about how I created this mythical setting which freed me to reimagine Cebu and its inhabitants in my fiction writing. I will also talk about some of my stories and fictional characters and how they were inspired by Cebu. You will find Ubek in many of my short stories and my three novels, When the Rainbow Goddess Wept, Magdalena, and the more recent, The Newspaper Widow. I'd like to start by giving some facts about the Cebu I grew up in before I go into the reimagining part. I was born after World War II, the youngest of four children. My parents were Mariano Flores Manguera and Concepcion Cuenco Manguera. My father had been in the guerrilla movement in Mindanao where he, my mother, and their three children lived during wartime. When liberation came and because my father's house in Manila was completely destroyed, my parents decided to settle in Cebu where my mother's family, the Cuencos, come from. We had a house and I grew up in it in back of the Capitolio area along a small road that was named to honor my father, Guerrillero Street, but the name has since been changed. The Second World War had left my mother malnourished with malaria, and I, in turn, was born in 1947 with beriberi, which almost killed me. I survived, and my mother credits her prayers to Cebu's beloved Santo Nino. She had danced her prayers to him so I would live. I went to school at St. Teresa's College in Cebu, which was ran by strict Belgian nuns. We are talking about the early 1950s when the sirens would go off at seven in the morning, noon, and five in the afternoon. As a little girl, I saw evidence of the war. I remember the ruins of the Veloso Paterno mansion across St. Teresa's College, its magnificent columns hinting at the grandeur of the place. A rusted World War II sea craft sat in the sea in Liloan. I even remember snatches of stories that my parents told their friends. They had been in Malay Balay, for instance. They had a horse named Rubino. Papa would disappear for days without Mama knowing where he was, only to find out that he had gone with the Americans to Australia. There was a doctora they said was killed by the Japanese. There was another person killed for owning a radio. There were so many war stories and I did not know it, but I had tucked them away in my young brain until one day I would write about that war much later on in my life. Mama, who grew up in the Parian, liked to buy her tablea, her chocolate and ojaldres from her suki there. She also shopped at the carbon market. On Sundays, we used to have picnics in Talisay where we ate lechon, puso, consilba. We swam for hours, we children swam for hours until our skin turned wrinkly. We also went uh, clamming, mangaikai. We bought our rosquillos from titais in Liloan and we went to fiestas in Mactan and Karkar and various places. Whenever we were in Karkar, mama would always talk about her mother's family, the Alesnas, who are related to the Montes Claros and Noels. I also learned about my mother's paternal side of the family, the Cuencos. The men were politicians. My grandfather, Mariano Jesus Cuenco, had been governor and senator. My uncle, Manuel Cuenco, had been governor of Cebu. Um, my great, my grandfather's brother, Miguel Cuenco, was representative. It, it ran in the family. But it was the women in my mother's family who fascinated me most. There was my mother's grandmother, 
Remedios Lopez Cuenco, who, widowed at the age of 39, took over running her husband's printing press, the Imprenta Rosario. Remedios was said to have been the first woman publisher in Cebu. I also heard about my mother's great grandmother, Juana Lopez, who came from Naik, Cavite, and who was said to have loved dancing when she was young, but who had a good head for business. Her business brought her to Cebu and to Leyte. At a young age, I knew about my family in Cebu. There was no television when I was a girl and radio soap operas and storytelling were popular activities. After work was done out in the dirty kitchen, our household help would tell stories and I would listen. Stories about the supernatural, Sigbin, San Telmo, Duende, Agta, in fact, our own jackfruit tree in the backyard had an agta, although I never saw it. And ungo, witches too. There was a local woman who wore black and used an umbrella to cover her face when she walked around. She really made an impression on me when I was a child, as did the woman who had poofed hairdo, she had hairdo like that, and she was said to have horns. There were so many aspects of Cebu that captivated me when I was a child. The big dance on Friday or Saturday nights, the amateur hour at the Fuente Osmeña, the evening processions with carrozas during local fiestas. The fiestas with open houses dancing in the plaza under streamers and there were the local queens. Our evening rides after school included a stop by a small uh, restaurant, a, a little uh, kiosk near Magellan's Cross where Papa bought us Cokes and M&Ms. And afterwards we would drive on towards the pier with a stop at Slapsy Maxi's bar where my parents would talk to the owners while we children stayed inside the Jeep. Slapsy Maxi's bar had colorful women with foreign sailors and so that's why we had to stay in the Jeep and I used to gawk at them. The return ride from our paseo always included a stop by Monai's bakery where we bought Pan Frances and Pan Monai. I also remember the violent typhoons that would leave the house in darkness because there was no electricity. And the good part about those typhoons was that there was no school. The most traumatic time that happened to me was my father's sudden death when I was nine. Fortunately, my mother had a business, had a good business mind to hold the family together, but this was a scar that haunted me and my family for years. In fact, my father's death nudged me to start writing. As a young girl, I started writing him letters to update him of my life. From writing on stationery and scraps of paper, I went on to keeping a journal. Once my sister gave me a lock and key pink diary and I never really stopped writing since I started writing in that little journal. For high school, I attended St. Teresa's in Manila in San Marcelino and I went to Marinol College for my Bachelor of Arts in Communication Arts. At that time, I wanted to be a filmmaker, which was why after I graduated from college, my mother sent me to California to attend film school at UCLA. As things turned out, I married a former Peace Corps volunteer who had been assigned to Leyte, and we settled in Southern California where we had three children, three sons. For many years, I was busy being a housewife and mother until the children were in school and I discovered I had some time to myself. I filled the time by writing. I wrote essays for a bi-monthly column in a newspaper and I started writing short stories, very clumsily at first. And so I took creative writing classes at the writer's program at UCLA Extension where I later taught for many, many years. I I'd like to talk to you a bit about how Cebu ended up Ubek in my fiction because my early stories didn't feature Ubek at all. I'll focus on some of my short stories and all three of my novels. One of the difficulties I had when I started writing was this notion of writer's voice. By this, I mean that my early stories lack a distinct Filipino voice. 
The stories were somewhat generic, so much so that a workshop participant told me that a graduate from Sacred Heart College in New York could have written my story. It was a critique that stunned me, but which left, led me into deeper reflection about this idea of writer's voice and also the other uh, various elements of fiction writing. To try and capture uh, my own voice, a Filipino voice, I deliberately set my stories in Cebu. I turned to my memories of the place and its people, as well as its history and culture. If you were an artist, you would call this the palette. This was my palette, if you will. Even though I knew how to construct stories and had some published stories, I used to get blocked. When I wrote, I used to get blocked. Using what was real compelled me to tell the truth, which just drove me to paralysis. And one day while doodling on a piece of paper, I reversed Cebu, C-E-B-U, into Ubec, U-B-E-C. And I stared at those letters on the piece of paper and I fell in love with how it looked and how it sounded. And I decided then to use Ubec as my mythical setting for my stories, some of them anyway. Suddenly I could transform the woman from my youth, the one who was supposed, who was said to have horns with a poofed hairdo into the sensual widow Agustina in my short story, Woman with Horns. This particular story, which is quite popular among many students is set in 1903 during the American period. I deliberately explored Cebu's history in my writings. Of course, this was not Ubeck's history, although many times the histories of Ubeck and Cebu ran parallel. The characters changed, however. I should mention that not all of my fictional characters are based on real people. Sometimes they are amalgams of characters, or sometimes the characters are purely fictional. That is, they just come to me. They appear in my imagination, sometimes fuzzy to start with, although sometimes they appear complete. Fuzzy or complete, I still have to flesh them out in order to be able to use them in my writing. In my stories, the geography of Ubeck has changed, and it has stopped being the real Cebu. Some landmarks remain, the old Spanish church, the Spanish fort, the Plaza Independencia, the old part of Cebu, this colonial Cebu. Uh, as I write, I make changes to avoid getting bogged down and to move the story along. What is important are my characters. Are they fleshed out and believable? Do they have conflicts? Does the story have tension? Do my characters change? That is, do they develop as the story moves along? Some of my stories are inspired by real people and events. For instance, uh, this is kind of a favorite story. The blue green chiffon dress is about a teenager named Gemma who has an encounter with an American soldier from Mactan. Now this, this sprung from that time of my life when the Vietnam War was raging and there was an American air base in Mactan. Those, some of you will remember the young American soldiers on R and R from Vietnam who roamed the streets of Cebu who were welcomed somewhat tentatively by Cebu society. Another story inspired by real people is The Virgin's Last Night. Some Cebuanos will still remember the two old maids who lived on Mango Avenue. They were my mother's sisters, Lourdes and, Cuen and Carmen Cuenco. Um, my tia Oding, Lourdes, didn't get married so she could take care of her younger sister, Carmen, who had health issues. That they lived together and they hosted family celebrations and they were very generous to us, uh, their nephews and nieces. They gifted me and my cousins money on Christmas. Tia Oding gave me family pictures when she found out I was interested in family genealogy. They were the ones who took care of the fam family mausoleum 
if you remember those uh, old fashioned mausoleums, ours looked like a three tiered wedding cake in my eyes. They were, these aunts were part of my childhood. When Carmen passed away, um, Lourdes followed not too long after. And I, I felt really sad, I, I felt great loss. And perhaps because of my sadness, this particular story, The Virgins Last Night, started shaping up in my head. The germ of the story was that when Lourdes was young, she had an ardent suitor whom she rejected. But this suitor still came back when they were older and still Lourdes rejected him. Perhaps as a way to give them life, my old maid aunts whom I loved, the story, The Virgin's Last Night, came about. It is about an old unmarried woman whose old suitor, Mateo, long dead, visits her as a ghost on the night when she dies. I also wrote a short story inspired by my father's sudden death. It's entitled Waiting for Papa's Return. This story about Remedios parallels my own story when I was nine and learned from our mother superior at school that my father had died of a heart attack in Hong Kong. In my story, because of the trauma the girl goes through, she suspends reality and continues to believe that her father will return so that they can sip tea under the cool shade of the lush star apple trees. So perhaps this was something too where I had suspended reality and that this is why I continued to write letters to my father, um, which started me on this writing career. I'm going to end part one here um, and we will continue. <laughs>